So here we are, ready to be transformed, are we not? Yes, we are. We're ready for the changes that are about to occur by means of each and every one of us. Don't you just love the idea that spring is beginning to appear? Oh, it's so jazzy. I tell you, I looked out at a tree that uh, for a long time now has been just gnarly and branchy and twiggy and empty. And I see all these little buds appearing. And I get giddy with delight because it's the sap rising, the energy of life rising in renewal of itself. And I know if it's going on out there, it's going on in here too because we're all part of the creative process. So this week we get ourselves in tune, in touch with the sap of energy of life rising within us all to take us into delight. Delight to take us into expansion, into bigness, into newness, into beauty, into loveliness and all of that great good stuff. Soon all those carpets of purple are going to be on all the embankments and we're going to go, ah, like we're seeing it for the first time. It happens every spring. The way that color bursts forward out of the appearance of nothingness much at all. It's a great good thing. And as I say, it's your opportunity and my opportunity to jump on the bandwagon of that and be part of that wonderful transforming process that's occurring. And besides, you know, when you're spiritually engaged with your life and your living, a spiritual life is a life of active creativity. It's a life of constant and continuous change into this transforming nature that each one of us happens to be. So we're going to get one with the process now, and we're ready, and we're going to go forward for the increase, for the more, for the expansion, and for the renewal of life by means of each one of us. And of course, the way we do that is by reviewing and renewing our minds. That's the way we do it, because it's all consciousness. Now, the best time for transformation, as I've experienced in my life, is that moment in time when you come to the point where you say, I can no longer, not for one more moment, can I go on living my life the way I've been going at present. It has to stop. It has to change. Something's got to give. Something's got to happen. Something's got to move. Something's got to be different than this. That's the greatest of all moments to make the decision to move into change, opening the door to transformation and a wonderful new experience of life. And it's at that point, that boiling point when you just can't stand it any longer and you haven't a clue what needs to change, but you know something has to change. It's got to give. It's got to happen. This is it. Enough already. I can no longer keep going on this merry-go-round that I'm getting dizzier and dizzier and dizzier. And this frenetic life that I'm living, this busyment of the embodiment, enough already is driving me crazy. And everybody else around me too. <laughs> and so that's the perfect moment of opportunity to move into the next phase, the next step, the next level of life and living. And so when we come to it, there are a few little steps that help us. When we get to that point, the first thing we're going to do is stop. Stop running. Put on the brakes. Pause. Press the pause button. Stop it. Stop it. Stand still. Come into this present moment now and be in it. It's the first thing we're going to do, in spite of the angst, in spite in spite of our resistance to look at any of it, stop it. Stop, 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 stop. Get off the merry-go-round. Stop. Be still. Pause. And then the next step is to be with whatever that looks like. To be with the thinking around it, the feeling around it, the angst in it, in it all, to just be with it, to recognize it, the state of your life at the moment, to recognize it, to be with it, to let those feelings be the feelings that you're feeling, let the thoughts be the thoughts that you're thinking, and give it 
a moment of pause so that you can recognize your state of life at the moment in spite of all the freneticism, the chaos, the angst, and so on. Just to be with it. Be with it. Go beyond the angst and be with it, present. And the next step is to look deeply into it all. Look deeply into it all, unafraid, or in spite of your fear, in spite of your anxiety, to look deeply within all of what you are surveying, and then to come to the decision to see what is real, to see what is true, and to see what is not real, and to see what is not true. And then you roll up your sleeves and you start dividing up the piles. The pile of ideas and thoughts and stories and projections and predictions and prophecies that you have accepted as your life, that you have slapped upon yourself and stamped it upon yourself and called it you. You're ready to look at all of that. You're ready then to look at the accumulation of all your habits and all your behaviors and all of your routines and your activities, looking to see what has become automatic, what has become static, and to again look at that and see what is true, what is real, what is not, what is unreal and then go into separating, sorting out, and deciding, I will save this, I will keep this, this is true, this is real, this is me. I will let go of all of these many piles that don't belong to me, that never did belong to me, that never really were mine. I imported them, I let them in, I said yes to them, they snuck in on me, and I <laughs> just allowed them to be me. Not so. And that's an important step. When you can do that, you've gone beyond the angst now, and you're being with it, and you're looking at it as it is, and you've managed to breathe enough, because you've paused, to step back a little from it all and be the observer and say, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, 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 no, no, no. And then, when you've done that, to take the necessary step that you're called to in order to go forward in your life. And the first necessary, necessar necessary step is always the decision to change. The desire, the decision to change. Change I must. Change I will. Change I can. And then you take what was left over out of your pile, and that's your set of building blocks in your decision to change and in your decision to go forward. And you start building on that. And the first building block is vision. You must create a vision for yourself if change and transformation is to come. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, I perish. Without a vision, I become static. Without a vision, I stagnate. Without a vision, I have settled for status quo. My life is not empowering me. My reality is not an empowering reality. I have said yes to meandering along in a mundane fashion according to status quo. That does not forward me in any way or develop me in any way or grow me in any way. Transformation, remember, it's a process. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's ongoing forever and forever and forever. And for transformation to keep happening on the good side of life, it requires for me a consistent and constant commitment and a renewal of that commitment. I love what the Buddha said when he said there are only two mistakes any individual can make in their lives. Number one mistake is not completing the spiritual journey to truth. And number two is not starting it. <laughs> not completing it and not starting it. Those are the only two mistakes that we make according to the Buddha in our lives. 
And so, of course, once we've come to that point, we've made the commitment, we're going to change, we set up the situation that's going to take us ahead and advance us, and we do it, and we do it, and we do it, and it's great, and it's starting, and the energy is rising, and we're going, and we're going, and then we reach the plateau. Boring plateau. Nothing happening, much of anything. Plateau. I don't know whether this is really for me, plateau. This really is not getting me where I thought I'd be by now, plateau. I don't know that any of this is much of anything anyway. It's all rubbish, plateau. That's when we have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And even if we step aside from that when we're on the plateau for a while and get distracted, the thing is, when we come back on our journey again, that's again part of the process of renewal, part of the process of change, and part of the process of transformation. So even though sometimes it thinks we've gone backward and we've fallen off the wagon and so on and so forth, we have in that moment, but once we've come back on track, we've just picked up the journey where we left off, and we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. Of course you and I are going to get sidetracked. It's going to happen. Plateaus are part of life and living on planet Earth. Have you ever looked at the mountain formations? Many of them are plateaus. Mesas. <laughs> flat. Straight. Flat. None of this undulating. Little peaks to look over. Flat. That's the way life is. You have to understand that. But you just keep trucking no matter what. It's like when you're driving. You drive, you ever drive through all of Texas? All of Texas? <laughs> I tell you, you're going and you're going and you're going and you're going. You're going and when is this going to end? I'd like to see something different. <laughs> But your destination is in sight and mind, and you keep going. Thank God for the good food places along the way where you stop off and you stuff yourself just to, you know, give yourself a new experience, <laughs> whatever that is. And so you keep going, and you have something to the impetus that push you along the way, and you do that. And that's where it is with you, and that's where it is with me. Remember. Remember, all of the great ones reached their plateaus too and had to go through all of that ho-hum stuff. But they kept going. That's what separates them from us. They kept going. They kept journeying. They kept picking up again, picking up again. They kept renewing their minds. They kept putting on the Buddha mind, going back into the Christ mind so that they could go to the next level and the next level and the next level. The vision is all important. Without a vision, we do, do live in the doldrums. Without the vision, everything becomes boring and ho-hum without the vision. And let me tell you, some of the great ones lived pretty chronic, awful lives at different times in their lives. They weren't all holy, holy, yummy, yummy people from the time they came in until they left. Not at all. Some of them were very, very highly naughty indeed. If you look at the life of King David, oh, mother of goodness. Lord preserve us, if he could do it, anyone could do it. Anyone could do it. The vision is so important. But for that vision to happen, you have to get still. You have to be quiet. You have to make the effort to do that so that the inner voice, the still small voice, can come through you and direct you with regard to your vision. Remember, everything you picture in your mind, everything you picture, you picture, your picture, is what you're living out in your life. You've pictured it in your mind before you've realized it or expressed it or experienced it. It's been in your mind. Doom and gloom in your mind first, and then it gets out pictured into your life. Goodness and greatness and wonderfulness pictured in your mind first, and then it comes into your life. It's always a picture first. We get the picture before we get the words. We get the picture first. We feel and think in pictures, and then the words come. The words follow. In the beginning was the picture, and the picture was with God, and the picture was God. The vision. In the beginning was the vision. In the beginning was the vision. You have to make your vision huge, big, absolutely amazingly stunning and magnificent. It has to be an MGM production in your mind. You need to do that. Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille in your mind. Nobody did it like Cecil B. DeMille. And so when you get that picture in your head, you have to create it and all the images in it and you have to put all the characters in there. And when all your characters and all your setting and your background is there, you have to get up and move into it yourself and become the part that you wish to be in that picture. 
and then you have to think it and you have to feel it and you have to back it up and you have to live as though it was so you have to feel as though it was so you have to think as though it was so you have to act as though it was so already you assume the feeling of the desired goal picture fulfilled that's the way it works how many times do we have to be reminded of that how many times do we have to be told that read that see that hear that smell that, touch that, and so on, before we truly get it. Without the picture, it's not going to happen. If you can conceive it, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. Napoleon Hill knew that. Everybody who has ever done anything that is remarkable first had a picture, had a vision, and they moved into the vision, and they lived the vision. And then it translated through them out into life as an experience. When Dr. Bitzer, the first teacher I had in religious science, Dr. Bitzer, when he was a young man in New York with, with very little as far as finances were concerned, he had the vision of himself and how his life was going to be. So every once in a while, instead of going to his usual deli place, which he loved and everything was great in there and so forth, he would go over to the, one of the most um, expensive restaurants in town and he'd go in there and he'd have a cup of coffee. He'd order a cup of coffee, a very expensive cup of coffee. And as he was sitting there sipping it, he would say to himself, well, is the coffee any better than the one I get in the deli? No, it's not. But boy, do I feel different here drinking this coffee than the way I feel when I'm over in the deli drinking my coffee. The feeling is different. The feeling is different. Like the couple I was sharing this morning, you know, they were living with their parents and they were scrapping and scraping financially and they didn't quite know how they were going to uh, don the life that they had envisioned for themselves, but they knew it was going to happen. So what they would do is they'd go to all the open houses. They'd go to the open houses, they'd get there early before everybody else and they'd play Lord and Lady of the Manor. And they'd go around the house and they'd admire this and they'd admire that. And darling, don't you like our wonderful uh, new set of whatever and look at that beautiful crystal I mean we're going to get so much enjoyment out of that be lovely sharing all of that with our friends and they play that they play that game they did that and they did that and they did that and eventually of course they ended up in a beautiful home of their own where they could share all of that with their friends they had the vision they had the picture they could think it they could feel it they could assume it and it happened for them. This happens all the time for very many people in the world. Why can it not happen for you, for me? Of course it can, but you have to work the vision. You have to give time to the vision. You have to go to some lovely, gorgeous place where you can be relaxed enough and, and filled enough and, and seem abundant enough to have that vision and to think it and to feel it and to journal it and to do all of that wonderful um, necessary work that it takes to bring your vision out into your realization. You set yourself up in the doctor's office, you're going in there and he's clapping you on the back and he's telling you all is clear, everything is good, all is well, and you see yourself feeling the feeling that you would feel when that's the case. You see yourself in the boss's office as he's shaking your hands and congratulating on your new promotion and how well you've been doing and how great it is to have you as part of the team. You see yourself married to that wonderful partner in your life and you see everybody else being delighted around you and for you and so on, etc. It works, it works, it works. You, why do you think all those people in the past, all those ladies had their hope chests, you know? There they were, they were all getting ready for their marriages and <laughs> their, mo their mothers and their girlfriends were giving them all things to fill up their hope chests with. And they knew beyond the shadow of doubt they were going to be married, not a man in sight. But they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt they were going to be married. And because they assumed that role, guess what? They all got married. The ones who didn't went into the convent or whatever else because they didn't want to get married, you know? And it's powerful. Your power of vision is amazing. And it's set in cement by the power of your intention. If you intend it, if you intend it, if you truly want it, if you truly know this is where you are supposed to be, you will set the vision to match the intention and you will inhabit it and you will live it 
And as you do, the pieces will all come together, coalesce in a miraculous way, and there you will realize your dream. You know, as Joel Olstein said, you know, when they congratulated him on his uh, first um, um, sermon that he gave in his new, um, you know, football pitch of a, of, of a sanctuary, he, he smiled to himself and he said, oh no, this is not my first sermon in this place. I have given hundreds of sermons in this place. I have visited this place. I have visioned in this place. I have seen this place. I have known this place. I have assumed the presence of this place. And this is far from my first sermon in this place. This is the outcome of what I have allowed to come through my life because I saw it. I visioned it. I, I have seen it. And he, and he shares the story of his own mother who was diagnosed with incurable cancer. And she was very ill when he came back from college. He didn't hardly recognize her. But he found all kinds of pictures of herself all over the house. He says, Mom, what's with the pictures all over the place? Well, she said, these are pictures of me as I see myself in reality and truth. Pictures of her riding horses, her wedding pictures, pictures of her with the children when they were young, pictures of her and all kinds of wonderful activities, being the best of herself and the loveliness of herself. She says, when I look into the mirror, I see death staring back at me. That's not me. That's not what I want to see. I want to see myself as I am. In truth, and I go around, I look at all these pictures, and I say, Yes, that's me. 35 years later, the woman is hale and hearty and going strong. Going strong. You see, the power of vision, the power of vision, the power of vision. But it has to be consistently supported, consistently supported. You can't vision for three days and say, See, it doesn't work. <laughs> I've been visioning all week, Reverend Moira. I've visioned all week. Nothing's happening. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Well, look at Abraham. He had a vision for years. An elderly gentleman with an elderly wife, and he's told he's going to be the father of generations to come. So much so you couldn't count the, the children that are going to issue out of his union with his wife and what they're going to bring into life and living in the form of a child. Oh, yeah. Well, what happened was he was given a great vision. He was taken outside when in his moments of doubt he couldn't kind of grasp that. He was told, look up into the sky, see the thousands and thousands of stars. He says, those stars are nothing compared to your descendants. Go down to the ocean and look at the sands on the shore, those sands are nothing compared to your descendants. And he began eventually to grasp that, grasp that he'd look up into the sky and be reminded of the great vision that the divine had given him. He'd go to the sea, he'd look at the seashore, and he'd remind himself of the great vision God had given him. And he just relaxed into the vision, relaxed into it, and lo and behold, we know what happened. The rest is history. The rest is history. And this is happening from those who are very well known to those who are not known at all. We all have these stories to tell. They are all amongst us, these people who have visioned their visions. They've dreamed their dreams and they've been one with them. They got into them. They became absolutely immersed, meshed and immersed in them. And lo and behold, it happened. That's all we have to do. Make the decision to change. Make the decision to open the door to transformation. Make the decision to take the first step. Vision. And I'm telling you, you're unstoppable. So this week, what we're going to be doing is focusing on all of those things, those thoughts, those stories, those predictions and so on that we've made our own and we're going to separate what's true from not true. We're looking at our habits, our, our inclinations, our activities, our behaviors and seeing what's true and not true there and we're going to take what's left over and we're going to start on that foundation and we're going to create a grand new experience for ourselves and move, spring forward forward into the new that's becking us. Are we not? Yes. Are you ready to do this? Yes. Are you ready to dream your dreams? Yes. Are you ready to vision? Yes. Are you ready for the change? Yes. Will you go with the flow? Yes. Are you saying yes to your good that wants to emerge through you? Yes. And are you going to do it? And when are you going to do it? Now. And so it is. It's done. Ready.